And we are live on Let Me Ask You This with Ronnie Barda. Did I pronounce that your last name right? Yeah, Ronnie. Yeah, Barda. Yeah, okay. Barda. Barda. Right. You're, hey, Eddie, hey, you're Eddie Bratz. Bratz That's right. right. Yeah. Nice. <clears throat> Thanks for uh, for coming on today. Thank you for having me, man. I appreciate, appreciate you. Uh, yeah, I appreciate you. Thank you. So, poker player, survivor, even did the uh, the movie tie stuff for a long, for a little while. So let's get into the into the poker stuff, which is I think extremely fascinating. You know, when did you? Because uh, you've been pretty successful. Yeah, that's uh, like the, out of the three. That's uh, you know, <laughs> Survivor, <laughs> Muay Thai, and then poker's like oh, at the top. So like, right. let's talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> what um, you know, how long have you been playing for? And when did you first, you know, when did you first start playing and know that you were going to be, you know, halfway decent at it? I mean, there's different levels. We can start like, like a lot of people have their stories of how they learn to play. Yeah. I mean, it, it goes all the way back to my dad's always been a gambler uh, since I can remember since I was the age of like, you know, my first memories of my dad scratching tickets doing 85 on Route 93, you know, like in 24, just scratching tickets all day long. So we were always in casinos playing Keno and doing such. And I learned to play five card draw like 12 13 then stud and stuff like that with my pops but i didn't start playing for real until about 20. um i had a fake id went into foxwoods i was mostly in the pits though and my dad oh, played because okay. my dad was kind of like, he's a degenerate gamble i love him but he played everything you know and he was he was he lost like 50 percent of his earnings a yearly in all these casinos and uh I would say, you know, I seen him play cards once in a while. I was like, oh, what, do you, what is this? We would stumble in the poker room. He would play stud after we played blackjack, Caribbean stud, and all the other you know, carnival games. And um, after a time, make a long story short, I realized, well, poker's a game of skill, and there can be money that money can be made. And uh, I became a professional when I was about 21 in 2000, 22, 2003, 4. And uh, I haven't looked back because I've been playing professionally now for 16, 16 17 years. So um, was that before Moneymaker won? Chris Moneymaker won, or was that when Robert Barconi won? So it was before Chris Moneymaker won. I was okay. and before I was in the casinos in nine and like, you know, I was there grand opening Foxwoods when I was ten years old. I was I remember coming first day we we're there as a family and then grand opening Mohegan Sun as well. Um, but with the Moneymaker boom is where I kind of shifted and I had that like gambling background, like I knew what it was to hustle. So I, I had that. Like everybody sucked back then. Besides the guys who were playing since the for a living since right. the mid-90s, like your Eric Seidel's and all these other guys and some of these old grinders like Myron Bernstein, who's there at Fox, which is, you know, like people, those guys must have had a fucking they had a party. So, but when the money maker boom happened is when I was putting more and more time in. And then I just realized I was making more money than I was at Sears Automotive, you know, pumping tires and rims. And, you know, and I just quit my job. Now, were you playing? So you were playing live before the online thing ever happened. Yeah, I learned at casinos. I was playing, you know, I, in Brockton basement, like where I grew up. You know, game it got big, and all my friends wanted to play poker in the basements, like everybody else. They were playing five dollars sitting goes, and, and downstairs or ten dollars. You know, we'd all get five thousand chips. We'd do ten minute levels, and we just do like a sit and go. And you know, and people were smoking their jays, and we'd play poker, and then I would start playing there, and we start going down to Foxwoods or we play in like clubs around like bar clubs and stuff like that. And I was getting, I would just win all the time. I was consistent at these places and took my game to Foxwoods and started, started crushing there. But now, to answer your question, I didn't play online much. Sorry. I played a little okay. on Sundays, but I, I learned uh, in the live setting. So. Okay. So when did you uh, make the jump? You know, when did you realize that you were pretty good at it and that you might want to play either a bigger, you know, bigger stakes or enter like a first tournament? So that's a good question. And and it's a lot, a lot of people ask me this question. Like I've gotten over the last, you know, nine, 10 years, how do I become a professional poker player? How do I know when to jump up in stakes? How do I determine if I'm good enough? And the, the question, the, the answer is, is you, you, you got to, first of all, take really good records and know if you're winning or losing, right? Because a lot of guys who play poker, they have other means of, of income. If they if they were the bartender and uh, they work in business, they have their own business, they do that, do this. So it's very, very important to take really good records, right? So how I determined if I was good enough is, like I said, I was working at a, a Sears Automotive and, you know, I was making more money hourly playing cards and, you know, going down to Fox was two, three times a week. I was, you know, hitting uh, the, their nightly tournament, the $100 buy-ins. I was final tabling more often. I was just better than – we all started together. Like, everybody 
I mean, I had some background, like I said, but everybody that poker boom brought a lot of kids, a lot of people in, and I just excelled a bit more than others. And I realized that my hourly playing poker is more than my job. And I dedicated my time to poker then, and I put a lot of hours in. And Foxwoods had this little thing called an act system with oh, satellites yeah. for tournaments. You remember yeah. that? Yep. And I really thrived in them because I played a lot of sit and goes online and I just would always win my seats in these 1100s. And if you, if you won it, then you would steps, right? So if you won your $10,000 seat, this is how I build my bankroll. You won your $10,000 seat, you're already in, sure. But if you won a second one, they would give you like a 5K seat, a 2K seat in the prelim and then give you like 3,000 cash. Third was all cash. Fourth was all cash. Fifth one would be all cash. So I would just grind these act ones and twos. And every single twice a year back then was the golden heyday of fucking poker. Is that all right if I put yeah. an F bomb there? So I'm sorry yeah. for the. That's uh, all right. You know, you could win multiple seats in these things if you had the time and you're grinding them. And I built my role playing acts from 2004 to 2008 when it was great. I would win like this, the least amount of seats I won in a, in, a, in a season was three seats. They had a 5K in this, and they had a 5K in the spring, which was a 10K later on, and a 10K in November. And the most seats I won for the 10K was six of them. So after the second, the third one, I won 40,000, 43,000, and I went, I had 17K in seats locked up. Uh, unfortunately, in those 10K events, I didn't do it. I took, I cashed in one for like 40,000 at Foxwoods in 2010. But my big score obviously came later at the World Series of Poker in 2010 as well. But that's how I built my role. And then I would just play one, two, no limit, two, five. And then I got into limit hold'em. And then I started traveling outside of Foxwoods in 2005 and six, like Borgata. My first time to Vegas was 05 as well for the World Series. You know, but I, did, I only did you, cash, did you cash that World Series in 2005? I didn't play the main event in 05. So I came out okay. yeah, in 05. I had like a 30K role. That's another thing about me. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm like a knit by heart. I, you know, uh, I manage my money really well. Uh, do I wish I took more shots when I was younger? Maybe, uh, but I've never been, you know, I'm very, I'm one of the very, very few, not to brag about this, uh, statistic about myself. I've never been broke. And it's like the guys who go broke are the guys who could also run up a million or 2 million. You know, you hear the stories yeah. about these kids. And I know a lot of them, like a lot of them are my boys, like, you know, I'll throw some names out there. Like, you know, I, I don't, I know he wouldn't care cause he just admits it himself like a Mark Newhouse and, you know, all these kids who just like, they win 2 million and then they're, they, oh, they owe money. They win another 2 million, they go broke. They went, you know, so I just didn't have, if I went broke, I have nothing to lean on. Like now, I mean, I have tons of resources. I have tons of friends that would take it, that would help me out, but I just wouldn't feel comfortable asking. So I just, you know, I'm very good at managing my money, managing, you know, outside of like just the game itself, being the, being a successful poker player is what you do off the table. It's not necessarily like obviously being good and knowing how to fucking bluff and make good calls and make good folds and what have you is a big part of the game. But what people don't understand half becoming a poker player, like half of it happens off the table as well. So the moment you became a professional poker player, you haven't looked back since. No, I haven't. Uh, the last three, four years, I've been like, you know, it's, it comes into, I'm almost, I'm 37. When I turned about 33, 34, I was like, what else? What's, what's next? You know, like, yeah, I, I've, you know, I've got a bracelet. I've broken some records. I've, I bought a house. I've done well for myself. I'm doing okay. I'm not rich. I, I am still passionate about it. I'm not like filthy rich. I'm comfortable, but like, do I want to play poker for the rest of my life? Yes. Do I want to do it for a living? No. So you know, I was thinking about other things. What should I do? Should I, you know, I, I mean, it, Survivor wasn't like, that's next for me. I was just a huge fan. I, I know we yeah. haven't gotten into Survivor yet. Yeah. But anyways, like, I would like to play poker for the rest of my life, but I just don't want that to like, I want to do something else, obviously. I want to get into something. Do I know what so it is when, yet? No, it's not sure. Now, when you were growing up, were you into, into sports or, or games? I mean, you have to have some type of competitiveness to, to want to be a poker player, right? Because it's kind of like you're competing against other people. Oh, hell yeah. I mean, yeah. Brockton, Brockton was a great town. You know, I had a lot of good, cool friends growing up. I mean, it's a big boxing city. You know, I've been in a, you know, my few share of fights, but I played a lot of basketball growing up in the neighborhoods. We would play all year long too, like through the winter, shovel courts, you know, fucking stubbing our hands in the ball, cold fingers, what have you. And we, there's, it, Brockton's a very competitive town. You know, I like, I was a decent basketball player. I never made the Brockton High School basketball team. If I grew up in Avon or all these surrounding towns, like Hanover or whatever, I would have easily made the team. Like, but Brockton, we just had five thousand students in our town, and we we had a really yep. good. We had some huge. We had some big athletes in our town. I almost made the varsity team my junior year, and 
got caught the last day. But uh, I, I played I played tons of basketball, two hand touch. I didn't play some soccer, but basketball was my thing. I love ball. I love basketball. So so being competitive, how do you handle? Because I this was my biggest thing is I can't handle a bad beat, right? So how, I mean, how do you handle a bad beat or like a ridiculous downswing? You know, where all of a sudden you're like, what is going on here? It's almost like the, you know the perfect gods are against you. Yeah, you know, you kind of get numb to it at, <clears throat> after you take beat after beat. You just, you get a little, you know, you get used to it. When you take a beat, you take, it's like, if I take beats by like people that like Rex or, or like people that are just there for fun, you got to shake it off. You can't let them know you're mad at them. You just, or, you know, just like laugh about it, be like nice hand and really, you know, and I mean it too. They're just like, you know, it, it's just the guys that like, who claim to know what they're doing and they're there all the time are the ones I like, I might lose it sometimes, but I would never do that in front of like, if there's like a few guys in the game who are Rex or yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to lose it, but you, you got to get used to it. Like variance sucks. When you go on huge downswings, you start questioning your ability to play. Like, am I, am I good? Am I still, and you just like check yourself and you go home and you're like, you've been doing this for how long, you know, at the end of the day, at the end of the, not the day, but the end of the year, usually and always I've never, I haven't had a losing year playing cash. Thank God, knock on wood. But um, I've had losing year playing tournaments, and that's understandable. There's so much variance in tournaments, you know, and shit happens. But uh, you can be on the you can be in the the awful you can be in that side of variance where you just get crushed day in and day out for months, and it's it takes a toll on you mentally, right? When I run bad and I start swinging down, I buy shit and I go on vacations. I'm like the opposite. When I'm winning, when I'm right. winning, Eddie, Eddie, when I'm winning, I don't want to do nothing besides play poker and go to the casino and keep riding that wave. As soon as I lose like 6,000 in a weekend or something, or I'll have a 10K downswing, 20K downswing. I'm like, holy shit, I got to go out and use this money on a pair of Jordans or like buy something for my father or, or book. I just go online, book a flight and go to some island and spend the money there because I feel like, what well, you know, like I, I like to buy things. Or or spend money when I'm losing money, and when I'm winning money, I don't spend anything. I'm like Scrooge McDuck. I just keep packing it and just keep going in there because I'm feeling focused and lasered and sharp, you know. And, yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. And when you're downswinging, Eddie, like you got to think about what's going on in your life. You having issues at with the girl, you know, issues with like other relationships in your life. Uh, how do you how do you feel? Any health issues? Are you exercising? Like these all play into like. You know, it, it could just obviously be a, a, a bad a run of cards and, you know, people getting lucky, obviously. But if are you playing the uh, the best hours? Are you feeling fresh when you're playing? Are you chasing like – are you sitting there like, oh, okay, I have to keep playing because you just got to – you know, it's it's important to take time off and, and, and really – and refocus and, and realize if you're playing at your most optimal hours and if you're feeling good playing. And if they're – if you if, – when I had girl issues and I was dating a bunch in my 20s, whenever fucking I was having problems with a girl, I would just – play terrible and I would just be off. That's for me. And I know it happens with a lot of other people as well, you know? So, yeah, sometimes it's almost like you're, it's a self-defeating pr prophecy where you're trying, might be losing, almost losing on purpose because of other things that are going on in your life. Right. Yeah. So the first time that you go out to Vegas for the world series of poker, did you, um, and you, and you played the main event, did you buy your way in or did you, uh, satellite in? And 2006 was the first time I played. It was the Jamie gold year. Okay. I, I won a seat on a sit in a single table sit and go. A uh, kid, a friend of mine had a piece of it. He had like twenty five percent of the single table. We, you know, and uh, so I had seventy five percent of myself. And I remember then you only had ten thousand chips. I was my it was my first main, and I um, busted at the end of day one. I remember I shoved like nine seven suited three hundred six hundred like eight k, and I yelled at the guy for calling me with ace eight off, which was an easy call. But then I just you know I stunk and I didn't realize like. I'm the, I'm the one shoving nine high here. I remember the hand. The guy's calling me with the better hand. I lost the hand to him, and I'm like, what are you calling me with ace with the best? I didn't say with the best hand. I was like this obnoxious idiot, and I was like, why are you calling me with the with the ace eight off? Are you serious? And I just walked out. Um, and then I didn't play the main event until 2000. I went to the World Series every year. I would just grind cash. That was my thing, man. Like Before I had that $317,000 score in 2010, from 2000, when I became professional poker in 2004, to 2010, I played satellites for main events around the circuit, like Borgata, like, you know, Foxwoods, Mohegan, Vegas, California. I would go to Commerce once a year, and I would grind the live action, and I will play their opening $500 event, which got a lot of people. It was good value, and if I could do well playing cash and win a seat in the main, I would play the main event. 
wherever I was. And I kept doing that. Like, you know, a lot of people just go to these events, blow half their role and then disappear and come back and they're borrowing and they're getting staked. And now they're, they're like in makeup. That wasn't me. I wanted to do everything on my own and I wanted to just pick and choose my spots. And then I had that score in 2010 and that kind of like, you know, people knew who I was from traveling a bunch, but that kind of put me up there. Now people like with the TV coverage and, you know, having that, having that financial, you know, burden lift off my back where I had some room to play other events. And that's kind of got me started the last 10 years. So now what was the first time that you, that you ever had a chance to play with, you know, the guys that everyone sees on ESPN, like the Negranos and the moneymakers. Um, you know, I played a lot of them in 2000, like 2004, my first main event, 2004 Foxwoods, uh, 10 K main event. I was, I remember I won a seat. Uh, that was the first year. I only won one seat because, uh, you know, I was just starting off and, I sat next to Chip Reese. He was on my right. Uh, I remember like it was yesterday and God, God rest his soul. And throughout the years of playing that 10K at Foxwoods, I played with Negranu. I played with Ivy. I played with, you know, everyone. I played with some old like Bill Gates, uh, not Bill Gates, Bill Gazes, just like Dragon, JC Tran, just like all these old school grinders, Mizraki. And they would come out and play all the prelims too because they, they wanted it. I mean, these things were huge. I mean, like, I, I'm just forgetting so many names. Ted Forrest. I can keep going on the list of like, yeah. I don't think I've ever played with Helmuth. Um, and were you intimidated the first time that you sit at a table with them? Or Yeah, yeah. It takes a while just to realize that they're human and they're just people like us. And just because they're on ESPN, you know, doesn't mean anything. They're just playing two cards like we are. Yeah, obviously they, you know, they've had some success and you, it's, it kind of fucks with your head a little when you're playing against them and you chat, you might play too tight or you might spaz out against them and you, that's, it's just I wish I could go back to my young self and and be able to give myself some advice. It's like that we're all yeah. human. It's at the end of the day, it's poker, you know. Like a lot, I see a lot of people playing these main events these days, and they just get they're so timid and so scared. And yet, granted, you get two hour level, so you can you can you get away with playing so tight. But you know, people don't want to bust, and they just make so many mistakes, and they play a little scared or a little gun shy, or they overplay some certain hands where. They don't realize how long the levels are, so it goes to each end, you know. So, well, they've they've changed the format of the World Series, correct? Right? It used to be more of a actual tournament, and now it's more of an experience, right? Where you get like two hour le levels. Oh, it's always been two. It's always been two hour levels. Okay. They, the only thing they've changed is the um, the stack sizes. So in two thousand ten, okay. it was like two thousand six or or prior to two thousand six. Every tournament you played for like 30, 40 years, whatever the buy in was, was the stack you got. Right. So if you played a fifteen hundred dollar buy in, you got fifteen hundred. Chips, but the blinds just start off small, small, like 25, 25. Yeah. My favorite time of the World Series is when they did 3X starting stack of the event you played. So, like, if you played a 1,500, you get 4,500 chips, 25. I like that. You know, I mean, people would argue against with me, like, Ronnie, you're an idiot. I like more chips, more better structure. I just, I just thought, like, you know, mistakes would get more, it would be more punished then. But it, I'm, I'm wrong saying this. The deeper you are, the longer the structure, the better it is for the better players. You know, I don't. I, I think the pro, that the height of my tournament game was was in 2012 to like 16. I'm a bit behind the curb now because all these kids who have all these programs and and you know solvers and they're doing so much studying. And the younger crew are just getting the kids online who adjusted live over the last five six years since Black Friday. They when Black Friday happened 2011, it took them three or four years to get really really fucking good. And then from 2015 2020, these kids are the ones who are excelling and 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 are, are the best these days. So it's, you know, yeah. so just, I like playing cash. Like I'm 95% cash now. Um, and I like playing world series events. I think I'm still a favorite in a lot of the fields. Uh, but I know my role. It's really important to know where you stand and to, to like, to get in your lane and wherever, like I tell people who play poker, like whoever, like people make fun of like grinders who like play game select or oh, you're a net. You're this like, they have nothing to prove, dude. These guys are making money. Like, what are you doing? Like, you want to go play against the best and go blow your role? Great, you know. So, so what was the what year was it when you had your your first big score at the World Series? Was that 07 or was that no? It was 2010. 2010. 2010. Okay. Yeah, it was. So it was how, I won a tournament for like twenty two thousand. So how does how does that tournament work for you at the main at the your first big score at the main event? Do you start uh, off Do you start off hot or? Are you grinding your way to a chip lead? To a, I was a the chip, chip leader in that. I was one of the chip leaders in that tournament in 2010. Um, you know, 
until 2000, like 2000, like the first year I, I played the main event, I was like chip leader, one of the chip leaders, like top 20, top 32, ch 30 chips until like from day one to like day six. And fortunately for me, I knew a lot of people in the media, like guys like Donnie Peters, um, you know, who, who I was close to, I knew from the East coast who did, who report, who gave me some love and, you know, put me on poker news then. And that kind of, you know, gave me a bit, a bit more, you know, being able to be in the spotlight and for people to know who I was, which, but I had the chip lead in, in 2010 for a, quite a while. And I remember busting Dan Harrington on the bubble in a hand that was on ESPN and, and which he really played pretty bad. Um, he's a legend, obviously he's made the final table. I'm nothing. He's from Boston too. I have a lot of respect for the man, but I guess he didn't, he played his hand against me. I, I can I remember exactly how it went. Um, but I busted him in the bubble and, you know, I was like probably 10 of 72, you know, I went down to 72 players. I was 10th in chips I got really sick. I got the I got the real flu. Uh, I was in the emergency room, and they had to like really. Me, oh, yeah, man. the end of day six, I went. The end of day six, where we bagged with like fifty something players or something like that, sixty something players. I had to go to the emergency room, and I had IVs. IV, I was like on my deathbed. I had like the flu, and um, yeah, I didn't get much sleep. I came back that day. I kind of blinded off my whole. Like I just just played like so passive and just tight. And I blinded off. We bagged for 27. And when we bagged 27, I was like 22 of 27. And then I busted to Filippo Candio, who was that Italian nutcase, that nut job who put that bad beat on Joseph Chong. I don't know if you remember a lot of this yeah. coverage. Um, yeah, I ran, it, I ran 24 of 25 big blinds, ace, king of hearts, steals, aces. And, you know, I just was trying to basically satellite because I'm like satellite was like some of my best game, like to satellite to the final nine. That was like when before Black Friday, you were still getting all, all these – crazy deals and like i won my seat on full tilt and if i won the main event that year i would have got an extra 10 million if i made the final table i would have got an extra million if i finished top three i would get an extra two million like third and second was two million i think final table is a million and first was 10 million and i was the last player with 27 left was a full tilt qualifier so i had a lot riding on that that year and granted i got three hundred seventeen thousand. i'm very privileged and happy to that was a great score you know it kind of set me up like i said and uh but things could have been different, you know, and obviously now, I went, yeah. How do you, how do you not like think about, I mean, are you thinking about first place when you're, when it's like, like 20 some people left? Like when I'm golfing and I have like the first three holes go well, I'm like thinking about breaking 70, you know, shooting under par. I couldn't imagine having 20 people in front of me and you're about to score. It's, a couple it re it's really insane. You, you are, you're down. Well, I don't, you know, who knows if I would have got that money a full tilt because I, it, that was November. I mean, I'm sorry. That was in the summer. And November nine happens, and they don't. They obviously, they pay you afternoon. So I would have had, you know, I would have had from November nine to the ten million thing was a million. If you won yep. the main event, it was a million a year for ten years, right? Right. So I would have got one million, and then I probably wouldn't have got the other nine because Phil Tilt, you know, went under. Obviously, I yep. don't think Poker Stars would be like, "Oh, you here's your ten. We're gonna give you the whole ten. Right. I don't think that's happening. So. um the answer to your question, when I was down to 27 players, I just remembered three fucking tables in the whole building. Like all of these tables are all gone, you know, and you're just down there and it's just like they're narrow. They're all feature tables. Even 2010, all three were feature tables. And for me, I wasn't really thinking about the win, which maybe I missed, you know, I was thinking about making it through every hand and getting to that final table. I was like, all right, if I can just beat out 18 guys. You know, even if I'm seven or eight or even nine or nine chips, if I have over 10 big blinds, 15 big blinds, I can have a chance and I can ride this. Like those are the days I missed. I, I mean, everybody likes this. Like, let's just play the main event out. But I really miss the days where you're like, just you're your November niner and you have like that three months to prepare and like you get to be in the line. Oh, really? That's interesting. See, I feel like I, I wouldn't really handle that. Yeah. People hate it. 99% of the poker players are like so happy. They're doing the way that what they do now, they went back to the standard. Like, let's just play it out. Yeah. And obviously like it, it take it like it, it uh, it, it it won't let allow players to like get coaching, from like right. all these beasts and stuff, and they'll just like it's just a pure poker right in the moment and everything. I'm sure they have some people on the rail doing this three days, but it it worked against some people. Though, like the guy Kenny Hallert, like got coached by Fedor and came in and tried playing all his year. I forgot what year it was. He just barbecued his whole fucking stack. He should just he had Fedor teach him, and then I remember he just came back and just like punt after punt after punt because he was making plays that. I remember watching that I knew he wasn't comfortable with or didn't like he was trying to he was trying to like apply a game that wasn't his. And to go off subject a little, I tell a lot of people who play poker, 
another advice I give to many people is be comfortable with the make the moves you make. And if you're going to like try different things, try to extremely low limit because doing things that you're not, you're not, you're not like comfortable doing it. It's not going to bode well for you. Like stick to what's working for you and slowly adapt and slowly change your game. A lot of people get coaches and just try to do things or try to mimic things they see on TV or, but if you don't know why you're doing them, like it, it could, it could, it could be bad. It could end up bad for you. So, yeah. See, I, I wouldn't like the no, the, no, the November nine thing because I feel like I would blow all the money I was guaranteed. Because do they give you the money? Do you, do they give you the money beforehand? Do you know that? Yeah, I, I think they. Yeah, then they gave you the minimum payout, which is nine. Okay. So yeah, right. right. So I would exactly. blow the money, and then I'd be the first one out, and I would well, like. But you blow right? the money, Eddie. But I just that's just what I would do. That's what gamblers do, right? You so. look like a guy who who could go blow through a million in about a fucking week. <laughs> it's just what do you got funny. back there? Those like figure. What do you got in the wall there? Figurines so, or something? Yeah, or? those are. Uh, those are vintage uh, wrestling figures from 1985. Oh, nice! So you're big. You're a big WWE. I mean, guy. from like 85 to like 89. Yeah. Yeah, Jake the Snake, fucking yeah. million million dollar man. Yeah. I know all. The, I love them. We were just watching like they had WWF all like up like yesterday. We're watching classic WWF oh, yeah. all day on Fox Sports. Right? They're showing it. Yeah, I collect yeah. these guys. I collect. I collect old vintage baseball cards. I like it, man. Yeah, I'm putting this set together. I've been doing it for 11 years Wait, now. Wait, what, what, what set? Th- what is it? What set is that? 1953 tops. Wow. Uh, these are just two cards. Yeah, I have the mantle. I have a few others, but I've been doing this for a long time, and I have about 70% of the set done. This is a really hard set to do, but I what, – um, what, grade, what grade do you prefer? Um, I mean, uh, I, I would prefer a gem in 10, but those are like – I'd have oh, to be a multi-million. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing from sevens to eights right now. Seven, seven and a half, and eights. My mantle is – uh, so. Do you have the mantle? Yeah, and a six and a half. It's not the grade I'd like it to be, but I'd like to upgrade at some point. I slept on a few. Uh, I slept on a seven and a half. Like the seven and a half in that set, uh, I could have bought for fifty one hundred seven years ago. Yeah. Um, I missed it. The guy wanted fifty one hundred. He said, "Give me five k." I said, "No, forty eight hundred." He said, "No." I went back to say, "Fuck it, I'll give him the five k." He sold it for fit for five k. And that card's wow. worth 20, 25000 now. Oh, my God. And I well, bought- I mean, every, everything now is, like, ridiculous. I collect – I'm, like, a Bo Jackson super collector. Oh, so wow. I collect, I collect all Bo Jackson PSA 10s. Okay. Uh, um, but it's just unbelievable. I was looking at, like, a Sammy Sosa rookie card for the heck of it because that documentary is coming out next week. It's the roof, dude. It was, like, seven – last year it was $7. This year it's, like, 300 I'm like, what is going on? They made millions of them. I bet I know. I don't think that like this is what I'm saying. Like, did you see with the with the last dance coming out? What's going on with the Jordan rookie? Oh, I know it's crazy, bro. That fucking card I could have bought a nine for like three k like a year right. ago. Now they're going for twelve thousand. Every one is going off, and it can't. It's not sustainable, dude. Like, I don't know if if, if there's people watching. I don't want to say it because I'm looking for this card now. Like, <laughs> but there's like the card I'm going to mention in a second. Or the card I'm looking I'm looking to buy, but. There's two cars I want to get, and I think that they're undervalued, and they're going to be extremely – they're going to go up a lot in the next, like, five, ten years. But um, I know we're going off a bit of a subject here with the baseball cards. But uh, (laughs) the Michael Jordan, if you look at the population report, there's 4,000 nines out there or something like that, something stupid. Like three to 4,000 nines, and they're going for 12,000 apiece. You look at a card like Jim Brown's rookie. You know, I hope the guy lives to 100 years old. He's one of the best, like, running backs of all time. Like, he's a right. star. There's only, like, 158, like, I think less. I think it was, like, 88 or something like that. And there's, like, there's like 10 or 15 nines. And then there's, like, I think there's only, like, actually, like, seven nines or something. And then there's, like, only 157s. And an eight is, like, 8,000. And a seven is still kind of affordable. It's, like, 2K. So I'm trying to get that. And I'm trying to get the Henry Aaron rookie. Because I think those are undervalued. Oh. Henry yeah. Aaron and Jim Brown, those guys are still alive. If they pass away, I think their cards will go up more. I, I'm not rooting for them to pass away. I, I want them to live to 120 yeah. years old. But, you know, I'm like, obviously, they're, they're legends, and I want them to have great lives. But I think they're they're huge legends, and I think their cards are going to skyrocket soon. I have I have an Aaron rookie somewhere around here. You have an Aaron rookie? Yes, it happened to me by accident. I was at a yard sale, and I was oh, buying awesome. some of these some of these like wrestling figures, and I picked up a lot of them, and – in the bottom of the box was a couple of like vintage cards or whatever. You Where know, was this? What what town? What uh, year? It was in it was in Western Mass. It was actually last, last summer. Stop it. It's, so I had, I have to get it graded. So once PSA starts grading again, I'm going to send it in 
see where it comes back. I, mean, still, it's not, not great I, I got off the phone with them and they can I, do you have it? You have it with you. Can you show me it? Mm, it's buried in these cards somewhere. Okay, then it's all right. Yeah. How, what's the good, what do you think will grade at? A four or a five or something? Uh, or? Probably like a three. I mean, I have this. I have this thing which I think could grade pretty well. I think it's a. Uh, oh, it's a fifty-seven William Mays. Yeah, I actually think this will grade pretty well because the corners are pretty good. That looks really sweet. That could be. I could. That could grade. It looks like. I mean, like from what I see, seven, like a six maybe, six or seven it's a, maybe. It's a nice card. It's a nice yeah, card. I'm trying, I'm trying to sell an Ernie Banks a nine fifty-nine Ernie Banks, but eBay. I'm trying to do my first sale on eBay, but they're not. Oh. Uh, and they're gonna cap you at five k a month. Five, right? They're capping me at five hundred right now. I'm like, oh, five hundred. And then there's no, there's no customer support. I try calling, they just no message, they, nothing. And they are like, so I'm just, I don't know. It's so funny. People, people come over and they're like, dude, how can you, you know, why do you spend all your money on like baseball cards and like, and then they come over like, dude, this is like the coolest thing. It's a great investment. I wish I bought more mantles. Yeah. I have like a fifty six mantle and an eight. I bought for fifteen hundred. Yeah. It's worth like ten thousand. I mean, like the mantles blew up. I'm looking for the next thing. I think football and basketball are kind of a little undervalued. The older guys, the population reports low, and I think, and I'm happy to see like guys like you are still collecting because there's like question that like okay, when these guys, when these older guys who baby boobers die off, are people gonna still want mantle? But the question, I think the answer is yes because oh, of course, people yeah. still want Babe Ruths. People still want Hornets Wacker and guys yeah. like Gary V. Vendercheck or whatever the hell his name. Oh yeah. Is. Gary he's Vaynerchuk, loving, yeah. yeah, he's loving cards as well too. It's which is great for I us. I mean, he's pu he's pumping and dumping them is what he's doing, but yeah, he's like he like he's buying them a year before and then telling everyone what he's gonna supposedly what he's gonna buy, which I've noticed. Mm. But it is interesting. Yeah, I, I want to get a fifty-one Bowman mantle and a thirty-three Gaudi Ruth is next on my list. Those are huge fucking cards. Like I I slept in the thirty-three Gaudi Ruth and a five PSA five at a show. Seven years ago, guy wanted four thousand for it. Now the card's like fifteen thousand. Um, a fifty-two Bowman. I slept on a, so many different cards. Obviously, I have so many stories. Now uh, a fifty-three Robinson, which I have in a seven, but I could have gotten an eight and a half or four grand. Now that card's like twenty. I mean, these cards are some of these cards. A little Clemente rookie I could have got for like five k. So and do I, you? Are you buying to sell them or just to keep? No, them? I'm. I'm. I've never sold a card before in my life. I want my. Yeah. I've, I keep. I have on my whole collection. You know, like this is, uh, this is. This is what happens when you listen to Gary Vaynerchuk. I have all these Pete Alonzo rookies that I'm like, oh, maybe I'll go out and buy a bunch of Pete Alonzos and try to sell them. See, I don't even know. What, I have no idea who that is. Like, I can <laughs> I can tell you right now. I can name every star from the 1933 to 1980, or maybe like the 90s. But I can't. All these new people. I don't. I the last I guy is Alex Rodriguez. That's like the last guy I know. <laughs> I don't know like any of these baseball stars, man. I don't. I I like. I like pre steroid era, like Hank yeah. and Henry Aaron. No, and like, I mean, everyone loves the cards that they grew up with. You know, my favorite card is the 84 Mattingly Tops. Okay. You know, I know that that's, card. that's like my, that's my favorite card ever. It was the, probably the first card I ever opened up a pack at like a card, sh at a card show and like got it in the pack. And I, you know, it's been like my favorite how, card how, ever. How old are you? 42. Okay. So you're, yeah, I'm 30, I'm 37. So you, 89, like that's what, so if you get an 84, my, my first cards I remember was a Ken Griffey rookie, and I have that card. Oh, yeah, yeah. The upper deck rookie '89 is the first card yeah. I opened, so it's like right on schedule. Like five years, five years, right. '84, '89, right? Yeah, yeah. So, it's so funny how that works Shaquille out. Shaquille O'Neal gold card was a rookie. I like that card. It's not worth anything now. Um, but yeah, I bought. I have the. I I don't have the '86 Flair Jordan, and I'm really upset about it. I have every Jordan from. I have '87 and up. The '87 I had. I bought for fifty dollars like ten years ago in a nine. Wait, nine. graded. Yeah, and a nine. I bought for fifty dollars. Wow. Forty dollars. That that card is booked for three fifty, but you can't touch it on eBay right now for like thirteen hundred. I saw the ninety Fleer is like skyrocketing. It's unbelievable. I have, I have four of them ungraded upstairs. That's amazing. Yeah, but they're just like <laughs> yeah, they're just like they're worth. I don't. I don't. There's millions of them though, but I, I guess like the people that want Jordan. I think all the NBA stars are home right now and bored, and they're buying all the eighty six Fleer Jordans. Is uh, the only way I can justify these things being this going this much. All these rich people are buying Jordan's rookie. That is interesting. Yeah, I maybe mean, that, that is that's something to think about. I guess when Gary Vaynerchuk told all those NBA players on a show to start investing in sports cards, that's what happened. Yeah, I think so. And he's uh, it's it sucks for it sucks for guys like us who he want to keep buying, but it's good for the guys who have these collections that are making top dollar. But like, I I don't think I just don't think oh. really hold that that it's not it's not like I don't think it can be that much. like you could have bought. Hold on, Ronnie. I'm gonna need you to back out and jump back in. Seven, the beginning of the year for twelve hundred dollars. Now you can't touch it for like four thousand. It's like three, three.
Oh, we're having uh, technical difficulties right now with, with Ronnie. He's going to have to come back in the room. Uh, I'll just message him here real quick. This is what happens when we are at the mercy of the internet connection. Maybe it was the baseball talk. Uh, let me see if I can just message him real quick. See if we can get him back. Yep, we're gonna ask about Survivor when he uh, when he comes back on. That was getting good. That was getting good too. Yep, Chip Reese, legend. I don't know what this means. Corona may help that come true. Not sure what that means. Um, we just had some technical difficulties, but when we get back, we'll get back on track. But obviously, I love talking about baseball cards because it's the greatest thing ever. You know, how can who doesn't like talking about? Baseball cards. So, does anybody have a question for me? Probably not. But when he comes back on, we'll. Uh, we're, I want to find out more about the movie tie stuff that he had done, and then also what it was like to get on Survivor because I can't imagine what it's like to even get on to get on a show. You know, to get on a reality show. Sorry, are you buddy. back, buddy? Sorry, yeah, Johnny. Oh, me. Sorry. I don't know what happened. No, sometimes it just freezes up. I mean, it's, it's the internet. We're at the it mercy is. of it. Of technology. Yeah. Um, anyway, getting back to the poker thing, when you win that three hundred, that three seventy, how do you not go out and buy yourself a fifty-two mantle? I don't know. And the thing <laughs> is, like, I, I know, I, I, it's a good question. I bought. Well, that's why I just told you I wouldn't have any money left because that's what I would do. I'd be out buying stuff that I wish I could buy, and then I would buy it and not have anything left. Yeah, they uh, the mantles on Heritage. I was looking at this Heritage auction uh, thing online, and like some of the fifty-two mantles went for under under like SMR for the first time. It was insane. They, a, a seven just a seven in the book is one fifteen. Usually these things go for over SMR all the time, right? Uh, and and it, it was a little slightly off centered, but it went for 90, 97 thousand. It went for like twenty k under under SMR. There was like a six and a six and a half on Harrods auctions that went for like under ten fifteen k. Um, but the fifty three mantles, I would get if I was you. I think the next best thing is a fifty three. If, if you could buy yourself a fifty three mantle, like a two or a three or any grade, I think those. I think that card. First of all, I think it's prettier than a 52. And I think the 52 is going to be out of reach for a lot of people. So I think the 53 tops card is going to be the next thing that people want. That's why it keeps going up. Like an eight was 9,000 and I want an eight. My dream is to get a 53 mantle and an eight. But now you can't touch it for under 37, 38,000. 40K. Wow. It's a nice card, man. I got it upstairs. I can bring it down if I run up there. No, that's, that's, a, no, that's that, that, yeah. that is pretty cool. Um, I forgot, I forgot where we were, but oh, yeah. So when you're, wait, so when you're playing that, that main event, right? And you're like, a, tasting the money do you do you get to sit at any tables with any celebrities that that i would know like any like actors or anything like that yeah i've i've, I've played with uh i played with bruno mars i played with mackay pfeiffer oh uh, okay i played cool. i played werewolves with mackay pfeiffer as well i played with uh what's the tall guy from everybody loves raymond I forgot his name oh, Br brad garrett brad garrett i've played with um uh, toby mcguire shannon elizabeth I've played with. I mean, I played with uh, Montel Williams. I've played. I, I can keep going on the list. I played with who else? Um, I played with the the real the guy who played Jason for like seven seven of the six of them six Jason. Oh, really? The actual Jason. Wow, that's cool. That was weird. It was at a. So it, he it was yeah he was a big guy. I played with um, Miss Finland. Yeah, I played with Miss Finland. Okay, yeah. so what can you? What happened? How do you let her bluff? It? What was the name of the show? The Shark Cage. It was a Shark Cage. The premise of the show was like, um, you know, if you get bluffed and you, it's this person successfully bluffs you, you have to go into a cage. But if you call the bluff, that person had to go in the cage. So if you caught somebody, and the and they would, when I mean, you're in the cage, you you miss one round of antes and blinds, okay? And what had happened was. I flew in front. There's no, I mean, no excuses, right? But I'll tell you, I'll, I'll give you, a, you know, the story of how it all how, how occurred. I was called for that show. I was excited. I went out. I flew to Barcelona. Uh, you know, I was, I was still adjusting to the time, to the time zone, you know, getting acclimated and stuff. And our celebrity, the, the show included four pros. That was one of the pros. It was after I cashed the, the main event five years in a row. And do they pay you for your appearance? No, the only, what, how they pay you is that you're free rolling for a million dollars. So okay. the first year was 48 players. So essentially I had like, you know, 21, $22,000 in equity 
Yep. You know, so um, yeah, I just got a seat, which, you know, I sold a little action to. So I sold 20% of that seat and still had 80% so I could win 800,000. But now I put, I sold that small markup, like 1.2, 1.15 or something. So I put 5,000 in my pocket, which paid for my plane. And I spent 2,000 on like, you know, food and, and lodging. And then I put 2,000 in the bank. So now I'm like free loaning a vacation and I have a chance at 800K. And that's how you, that's how you do things. You go, you, right. you, and people want to sweat. My friends wanted a piece. They're like, oh, this yeah. is amazing. So it's four pros, uh, one qualifier, and one celebrity sports athlete. And our celebrity was Miss Finland. So we have some time where you do makeup and you do like some pre stuff, you know, pre game stuff. And I remember talking to her and I just want to kind of feel her out. And I'm like, so you, she's like, oh, I play, you know, I, I like me and my boyfriend play and I played this main event yesterday called the Estrellas main. It was part of this e the EPT series in Barcelona, which is a $1,000 buy-in. She said she made day two. So I'm like, all right, this girl, like she knows what she knows how to like read her hand. And she, cause there's been people on that show that literally don't know how to like bet chips. Like they've had like soccer players, rugby players that are like, okay, I think I check or I think I'm all, I going to go all in. They're like, there's, you know, they have some, they have some knowledge, but they don't, they, you know, they haven't played poker maybe a handful of times. Right. Right. But she said she played a bit and she made day two of this tournament. So I'm like, okay. So now, they, now they deal this infamous hand that everybody's, you know, it has to, over 20 million views collectively and guys like Doug Polk and Daniel Legrand, who's broken down and people clown me every poker room I go to, they call me Miss Finland. So now yeah. the hand happens all over the world. Uh, people know me for, I, I, I love when somebody goes, I know who you are. And I'm hoping they say you cashed a main event five years in a row and you have a bracelet, right? I'm like, yeah, that's me. And they're like, oh, you, you're the guy who fucking Miss Finland ruined. And I'm like, yeah, that's me. So now this hand happens, and it's the first hand dealt off the deck. Okay, she limps the cutoff. Do you want me to? Do you want me to break this hand down? Yeah. She yeah. limps. She limps the cutoff, and I'm just like, all right. Small blind is Kara Scott. She folds. I have eight four off. And like I told you before, in 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 this uh, conversation, that I play sitting goes for a living. I know how to play sitting goes better than most. My my style is really like suits sit and goes very well. Normally, I would just check my big, I would just check my option, which I did. And normally on the queen four five flop, I flop bottom pair with eight four, king, right. queen five four rainbow. I would just check fold to a seat bet here. It's just a spot that you don't want to get involved in. And it's like you just want to move on. Like early in sitting goes, you just try to cool with people, you play extremely tight, and then you get to a point where you, you're in the shove folds. If you can't cool anybody, if you can't like build the stack a bit. Uh, you now are playing the shove fold, the shove fold game, which I'm very good at, right? Sit and go structure because it was kind of a turbo. But anyways, I'm like in this situation, I'm like, all right, this is young, really beautiful girl who doesn't have much. She doesn't play poker, so she's gonna play face up. So I'm just gonna lead into her with bottom pair. And if she doesn't have anything, she's gonna fold. I'm gonna deny her like equity of whatever hand, hand she has and just like move on. So I bet fifteen thousand. You start with a million chips. Okay. I bet fifteen thousand, and she min raises me. And at first thought, I'm like, I remember like it was yesterday. I'm like, okay. She meant, she's like, uh, I raised 30,000. I'm like, okay. She has like queen X here, queen 10, queen Jack. She limped. She might have like, you know, some kind of queen. Maybe she's like min raising me. I didn't think she was bluffing. I thought maybe I she could just be like, I'm going to raise and min raise it and see what you do. But my head just said she has a queen. So I'm going to call. And if I can peel a four and eight off, I'm going to get some value on later streets. It's only a min race to me. So I call. The turn's a four. Bingo, right? I'm like, boom. Okay. I check the turn. She bets 50,000. Against most players, I'm just going to check call to keep bluffs in their range to see what they do on the river, what's their sizing. Maybe I check raise the river. Maybe I just check call again. Maybe I lead the river. But against... Miss Finland and against her like, an inexperienced wreck, I want to put some chips in the pot because they're never folding a queen here. But I want to make it small enough so that I'm not scaring them. So I made it 150. <laughs> and she just sits there and she's like, looks at the dealer, which is a sign of strength. She's like, I raise. He goes, he raised. He, she, and the dealer's like, yeah. She's like, I raise. And she clicks it back and makes it 250. And now in any normal setting, I wouldn't make like, I wouldn't bug out like I did. But what was great for TV? I was like two hundred. I'm like, what are you doing? Two hundred fifty thousand. I was you know, like trying to give poker stars their value for inviting me on yeah. the show, and I wanted to give them good TV. And I'm like, okay, I call, and I'm looking at her, and and she, we talked a little, whatever. I call, 
So they're like, I'm like, I don't know what she's doing. I don't know. She's like what she's representing. She has fives full, four five. She limped queens. I, I, I don't know. I, or she's just like what I thought in real time is what she had a queen still. And she didn't know what she was doing. And she's like, you are not going to raise me. I'm going to raise you because I have a queen. Not thinking that I could have, like, she's not putting me on anything I have. She just looks at, that's what most beginning players in their first three months of playing just worry about their hand, right? So she, so I call. Now I have like 280,000 of my a million there. I have 720 behind. And there's about 600K in there with blinds and annies. The river is a six, which completes two, three, and a gut shot, seven, eight, which I didn't, didn't give her. I check. She thinks for a while and she fucking shoves it all in. And I sat there and you seen the whole the whole hand and I played it back and I showed her the four and she she didn't even know what she was doing. So she's not she was she didn't seem nervous. When I look at the video back, I when I'm looking down at my chips, I can see that she's kind of like being a little weird, but in real time I didn't see that kind of reaction. And you're on a timer. And um, the whole the whole thing about like getting bluffed and going to the cage didn't enter my mind because I thought there was no fucking way in hell this young lady or was never bluffing here. I didn't think she was capable of doing this, like going ape shit, min raising, clicking back my bet on the flop. I mean, min raising my bet on the flop, clicking back my check raise, and then pile driving when I checked to her. No fucking way in hell. So when I talked to her, I'm like, you just have a queen. And she's like, you know, you know, she's sitting there. She doesn't know what's going on. I show her the four, dead, just dead face. And I'm like, wow. And I just can't, I can't just risk my whole like, million dollar chance here. I still have 72% of my stack. It's a sit and go. I can grind the stack. I still have 72 bigs, which is a shitload of chips in the sit and go. And I decided to fold. She sows the bluff. I get embarrassed. Like everybody's seen, I walk into the cage. <laughs> when I left that show, I ran the hand by Ole Shimeon, Jason Mercier, like my friend Donnie, who's I'm, who I'm quarantining with now, who was actually, who let me, let me stay in his room that during, during that time. Um, and a, a couple other pros, and they all said to me, fold. Yeah, easy fold. Easy fold. But when you watch the hand, you're like, you're an idiot. What are you doing? Well, it's easier when you can see the cards, obviously. Yeah, it's easier when you can see the cards. And for a lot of people, it doesn't like – obviously, the hand the hand like got so much attention. It was on Reddit. It was on World Star Hip Hop. You should have seen the comments on World Star. It was fucking – that was hilarious. <laughs> and, yo, yeah, everybody thought it was real money, and like it was just hilarious. Yeah. I read all the comments, and people were just calling me a scrub and a moron. People don't really understand poker and – the YouTube, it just got a lot of attention. You know what? I'm happy about it. I, I, I love that hand. It was great. I think, you know, if I didn't make the reaction I made and if I didn't act the way I acted, it would, if I didn't fold, it was just, and, and she got a poker stars deal for like a year and a half, two years. They flew her around everywhere and put her in every single On that one hand? Yeah, dude, they gave her a deal. <laughs> I like, me and Sarah still chat once in a while. She's a great, great girl. Uh, they gave her a deal and she was able to play a lot of big tournaments uh, for a year and a half or so, you know, so. Uh, I did have a question about the uh, – so when you play the World Series, you've been at a TV table before, right? Yeah, many times, yeah. Do they well, make you – what happens if you don't show your show your cards to the camera? They frown upon it. They like There's a lot of pros who don't like showing both cards. They show one. They kind of mess up. They play around with the production, and production hates that, obviously. They keep, they'll, they'll stop and be like, listen, you got to put your two cards right here. You know, you got to – you know, I never had that – I don't mind, like – I hate being on TV tables. I just like I, – I I got used to it over the years, but I, I don't like them because I, I feel like they have – they kind of mess with my head a little and I'm like people are seeing my hands. I, I, I don't want to be bluffed in this shot, so I might call looser or I might make a bluff I don't usually make. And it really – it messes with – I mean the messes with most of us to be honest. I, I, I can, I'm not – I don't want to speak for the whole poker, poker community slash world, but for me and I think for a lot of people it kind of like – Fucks with their game a bit. Yeah, I would. I could. I could see that. Especially with the whole, you know, postal now with the my postal oh, stuff. Yeah. Like, who knows if like, I shouldn't make any accusations on your show, but other you know venues or have these tables with the hand read card readers, and you know, you never know. I, I'm sure it wasn't the only time postal was the only thing that happened. I'm sure. I, I love the WSOP, and I'm sure everything was pretty kosher with World Series of Poker. I think they've done a great job, but who knows? And other other different types of like you know live feed games and stuff like that. Right. right. Oh. So after, did, did you end up taking a break? Cause you obviously you played everywhere, right? You've been in Vegas. A, a, you played that tournament in Aruba, Barcelona, and then you ended up taking a break. Did you take a break from poker when you went to, to was it Thailand you went to? 
No, I went to Thailand like 2000. That was before my success. I went to 2000. After my $317,000 cash, I went to Thailand like 2012. Then I won a bracelet in 2012. And then I okay. went again in 13. I went again in 14. I went again. I just went again right now before the quarantine. Yep. Um, I didn't ever took a break. You'll see like a break in my resume. It's because I just stink now. You know, I just don't win as much as I used to. <laughs> no, I don't play that many tournaments as I used to. Yeah. Um, you know, becoming like a lot harder. And uh, I'm not old, you know, but we're old in poker, me and you, Eddie. Like, you know, you know, once I hit like 33, 34, it takes, it's very taxing sitting down long hours, especially you can't take breaks. Like in ca- I like playing cash. I can play three, four rounds. I can go skank around the casino. You know, like I can, I can run around, do my walks, and I can sit up in my chair. I can do a dance. I can do this. I can do that. I can get up when I want if I'm not feeling it. You know, you, you, when, you, when you register a tournament, you're dedicating – like you, you plan to win it. So you're like, if it's a three-day tournament, you're going to play for fucking three days straight. It's, right. it's, a lot of, it's a lot of work, dude. Well, that's why I was impressed when you when I saw the uh, the movie tie stuff that you were doing because I was like, wow, this is a, that's a lot of stuff. That's a lot of training that you were doing, right? When yeah, doing- yeah. I dedicated myself in Thailand for like my first time there was two months, twice a day, two hours a day. I mean, uh, four hours a day. So I really got seriously conditioned, like where I was ready to fight. I could have you know took on the first fight, and then I, I never thought I would want to fight when I went to Thailand. Yeah, yeah. Like, I'm just gonna go learn Muay Thai at 30 years, 29 years old, 30 years old, and get really good at it and learn, 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 us, uh, um, you know, a, a form of self-defense and I can learn a lot. This would be great for my body. But then when you start doing it day in, day out and you start training with all the Thai dudes and you get your shit kicked out of you and you start like doing better and you start noticing your kicks are getting stronger. You start killing the nerves in your, in your shins. Yeah. These Thai girls are rubbing your shins with wood and you're crying and then they keep doing it. It doesn't hurt anymore. And now you're kicking the shit out of these cement bags. Now you're sparring perfectly and you're doing good and you're getting hit and it's great. And now they're like, Hey, and all these Thai dudes are like, you should take on a tie. You should, you should fight. You should fight. And then I kind of like, I was on the cusp of like taking my first fight and they always match you up. They do pretty well. Like if somebody else's first fight, but I was like, yeah, in the States and in Europe, when you fight your first Muay Thai fights professionally, by law, you, you have to put shin pads on and headgear and you can't elbow your first like six or 10 professional fights in mm-hmm. Thailand. That's fucking out the window. Elbows, knees to the face anything goes. And I was, I, I didn't want that. I'm not calling myself, you know, you know, soft, but I was like, I like my nose. I have a fucking, yeah. I have, I, I have a, like a, a, a bird nose and a soft chin, you know, and I have no neck. My neck's like a Corona bottle. I would get, if I got hit in the fucking head, I, I don't want to sustain some kind of brain damage. So I said to myself, yeah, I sparred enough. I've had a concussion. I've had a black eye. I've broken, I almost broke my nose a few times. I was like, you know what? I don't want to like, Fight. Who wants to take a knee to the face? I mean, I don't want know. to take a knee to the face. Right. You know, I would probably, if some poker player ran his mouth right now, <laughs> I would like set up a fight and maybe like at, I'm almost 38 years old and they wanted to do it with headgear and 16 ounce gloves. I would go do something for charity slash side bet between me and the player. But besides that, I'm all set. I'll be, I'm good with like you know my my head on my shoulders and I'm I'm okay. Hello, we have a comment. Somebody wants. Somebody says I missed the start. Did you talk about your old Foxwoods days? And how you built your bankroll. Yes, he did. He won a bunch of tournaments. I remember you kind of ran with the crew. I was one of the original two players there. John Levins. I wish I had John Levins' face if I can see it because I'm good with faces. Yeah. I remember all types of faces. Um, well, you know, the reason I brought the movie tie stuff, did that help you mentally? Because I I've been, read yeah. a lot about people that do stuff. Does that help you mentally with poker? It, it changed my life, to be honest. Like, I came back and I was crushing. 2012, 13, and 14 were the best years of my life in terms of poker. I I won a bracelet when I got back from when I got back from uh, learning Muay Thai. I just felt like poker wasn't everything anymore. You know, I had something else that I right. really liked doing. Uh, I gained a bunch of discipline. Uh, I, I, you know, learned so much about the Thai culture. It gave me a, a brand new perspective on life itself. Um, I ate a lot healthier. I was eating a lot cleaner there in that time. And like, like I said, this goes back to our conversation about, you know, where being successful is like. And poker, like 50% of it happens off the table, whether it's taking care of yourself, obviously, sleeping, sleeping well, you know, um, eating optim- eating, eating well, uh, picking the right games to play in, managing your bankroll, you know, and stuff like that. And there's so much, so much more. So how long – and then was it two years ago you did the, you did Survivor or was that uh, – We years? filmed Survivor a year ago. A um, year ago. Well, so years uh, – yeah, a year now. Uh, we would have been ending about three weeks ago was at the end of filming. When you know, did that, you make the, the, the decision that you wanted to, to try that? How, how does that whole thing happen? When Anna Kate got casted for Survivor, um, 
she was on Survivor season 32. She used the title poker player. She was a, a, a regular at Brigada. Um, you know, I don't want to, you know, she's a nice girl. I've talked to her many times. You know, we're, we're acquaintances slash friends. You know, we're not close by any means. But, you know, I don't want to throw under the bus when I say this. But it kind of like kind of put – it kind of made me mad because I didn't really think she was a poker player. Like mm -hmm. she just like – you. you if people want to come into the poker play and say, I'm a professional poker player, that's great. I, we need more people like that for the game to keep going, right? But for this person to be on the grand stage of reality, the biggest, best reality TV show of all time and say, I'm a professional poker player, that kind of made me, it kind of steamed me up a bit. And I was like, this girl is representing the poker world, representing poker as a professional poker player. She's a 2 5 on and off player who goes into Brigada who dates this kid I know who actually plays professional. And she's not, she's not, she doesn't play anymore. Like, I'm a fucking kid who like grew up with a king of spades in my left pocket pocket. Like I'm a professional poker player. Rob Garrett Adelson is a professional poker player as well. He's great. Like those are like, I wanted to be the best representation of poker. So right. like the next year I was to start to watch, I started binging like 2017 and 18. I started binging all survivor. I was like, this is a fucking amazing game. Yeah. Did I know that I watched it like everybody else did back in 2000 when Rod, R Richard Hatch won the first season? I did. Then I kind of fell off like a lot of other people. Yep. And I got back into it. Like the game evolved. It got really cool. New, new twists and different things. Idols came out. Advantages. Uh, you know, they start casting a whole diverse crew and people from different walks of life. And it's such a pure fucking game. Like I fell in love with Survivor. It's it's Survivor's just and encapsulates so much of real life in this like reality TV. It's it's just so it's comp like the social dynamic. The the you know survival uh, aspect of it, uh, the the physical part, the strategic part, you know, it's just it's just like so it, it's so many parallels between the game and poker. It's just it's just great, and I I knew that I had everything it took to become a really good survivor player. Like I'm a people's person. I've always got along with everybody I came across, and it, I've I'm a, I have so much tolerance for different people's behaviors. Like you'll see me hang out with this guy and and this guy, and and those guys would never hang out with each other. They hate each other actually. And I, I, I don't like to, to blow smoke up my own ass, but people just say like Ronnie Bard is like a really cool, key, uh, you know, keel kind of like even guy. And he like, you, you get along with him. Like people, I get along with everybody, you know? And I just knew that if I got on Survivor, I would fucking make some big noise and I would show the world my personality. I'd crush and I'd have a chance at a million dollars. And unfortunately, something happened before going on which I wrote up on my Twitter page. It's my, it's my pinned tweet. Uh, when I was casted, I was in perfect fucking health. I felt amazing. I was like, like I always have been, I had some stomach issues back and like everybody has when they turn 30 in like 2000, like most people and most Jews, like myself, I'm Jewish. You know, I, I went through like a year and a half with some stomach issues. I changed my diet. Like I said, yep. And I got better and that was it. But then I started like, not to get so much in detail. I started having these like really debilitating pelvic floor symptoms, like rectal and pelvic floor symptoms, which I, didn't know what it was and this was after casting it's about two so months this is after after you already know you're going on the show i didn't know but i had a good idea like i knew okay. that casting loved me they yep. they let like i made it through finals you get you go to finals i knew they loved me i jeff probes interview matt van wagen the executive producer he was i was his favorite one of his favorites i killed like the producers meetings i made it through the final stage of cbs the suits like with all the, the big execs and stuff i was fucking killing the room I had everything going. I just like this, bi this vibrant ball of energy who had such a great background between my poker life, growing up in inner cities in Brockton, Mass, my accent, my look. I was just like, I was a grand slam for casting for them. Again, they loved me and I loved them. And it was a great relationship and I couldn't wait to, to showcase me and my ability to play the game. And now it, it was like timing, like decided to say, Ronnie, fuck you. And, you know, I'm, I pride myself to be a very logical normal rational human being yeah i'm a bit nuts to be a professional poker player you have to have a bit quirkiness and be a bit little off to you know but i started feeling all these these this pain these symptoms in the left lower side of my lower back and going into my rectal like pelvic floor and i started going to all these doctors and at first i thought i like you know they get personal with you on on, on the show i thought like oh do i have an std let's check that out nothing do i have this they did x-rays they did cat scans and Two weeks prior to going out on Survivor, they send you the slip and they said, do you have any new diagnosis? Now, I went through all these tests and I came to, I ruled out everything that I wasn't dying. I didn't have cancer. Yep. My blood work was right. 
my x-rays were 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 uh, remarkable or unremarkable whatever word like it shows that nothing there and my everything was fine but i actually felt like i was dying i honestly i swear to god and i and it just every step i took to get better made me worse i took tons of antibiotics before going on the show I took tons of different types of pills and i didn't get any better and it actually got worse and i wasn't going to I was, this happened two months before going on the show and I wasn't going to let this get in line with my dreams. And I thought that I'd be fine. Like three weeks before going on, I'm going to figure this out. Like two months, I'm going to figure this out a month, two weeks, acupuncture, drugs, this, 10 different doctors. Nobody can figure it out. Now the big days here, we're off to Fiji and I feel like I'm 76 years old and I'm dying. I, I, I don't know what's going on down there. And when you're at Ponderosa where they put you pregame, you sleep in tents, that didn't bode well for me because I didn't get rest. And when I didn't get rest, my, my symptoms got worse. And now we're doing all this pregame interviews and stuff. And I was trying to mask the pain. I did a pretty good job at it. And now we're on the island and trying to, you're trying to form alliances and bonds. And I'm clearly not who I am. And these people don't know me. It's the first time they come and counter with me. Right. Besides like all the interviews Jeff and all these other people did with me, like they knew who I was. They knew what I could bring to the table. And now they see somebody new, like who the hell is this guy? We casted Ronnie Barta, this vibrant fucking nutcase, like, funny person and who's this shell of himself and they and i feel bad that i let them down and to make a long story short everybody in my tribe like it was the first time in my life like i walk into poker rooms ronnie what's up everybody's like playing with me everybody's like lo loving it we're having a great time every 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 person i encounter out in the real world that if it's at starbucks or a fucking target or a different countries like i am accepted and people love like i can carry conversations i I'm good at that. I'm a people's person. And now where it matters the most in a game like Survivor, I crumble and fall because I cannot deal with the debilitating threshold nine to 10 pain. And I couldn't sleep at night. I didn't never, I didn't sleep the first three. I have no problem. I've camped my whole life at Mount Washington in the White Mountains. I've slept in the ground. Like we, we did old school, like small tent, like sleeping outside and sleeping bags. I, I can sleep on the beach. I, but I couldn't sleep because I was in so much pain. I was taking these pills to make me feel better. They didn't do, they didn't do any justice. I finally figured it out. It's called, I have a condition that's, it's curable, it's treatable that I'm I'll basically 99% better called pudendal neuralgia. It's a uh, nerve neur neurological issue that runs through your pelvic floor. It's uh, prolonged sitting kind of fucks with it. Um, Muay Thai, like I was like, even I was still practicing kicking the bag a lot. Yeah. I kind of, I have an impingement of a nerve that runs through your stomach into your pelvic floor and the three branches runs to your rectum, your testicles, and your penis, and it can cause symptoms like you don't want to know. Like, Jesus. yeah, it's awesome. like some, if you look it up, you can look it up, epidendal neuralgia. It is not something that I w wish on, maybe on my worst enemies, but <laughs> on anybody, on anybody, you know, like it's, it's, it's bad. And it just sucks because nobody wants to hear about, first of all, like nobody wants to hear about health issues. You know, nobody wants to talk about it. You, you when you tell, you, you kind of feel like, weird and you, you feel you know it's just it's personal and it just sucks and and to have that happen at one of the m most like you know once in a lifetime opportunities ever in my life it sucks and it, it it really like really affected me mentally over the last year like when it all happened yeah. coming off the show you know being at ponderosa waiting for everybody else to come off you know not because you, you, you sound like a bunch of excuses. You're trying to tell these people like, yo, you don't know, like I'm this person. Like, right. I was like showing all the people that got voted off. Literally. Like we didn't have any access to electronics cause they didn't give you, you, you have none for 39 days. But when we had a chance where we like got babysitted and they put YouTube up for us, I was showing that people got voted off like my ESPN clips and the Miss Finland hand and you know, stuff from my neighborhood, my Muay Thai clip and all this. I'm like, this is me. And they're like, Oh, cause I, and they're just like, okay, loser, relax. Like, you know, that I, I just, it was just like, I did I felt weird telling them like, Oh, I had this problem that happened. And you know, I, I hope one day I'm able to play the game again. They do a yeah. first boot. They do a first boot tribe or season. I think I have a great redemption story. Now that I'm like, I'm basically hundred percent better now that I know what it is. And I'm, I'm basically right. cured and I'm out the water. I know how to treat myself and I gotten the right diagnosis and the right treatment. It's just fucking fucked up timing and, and it just sucks. You know, no, it really that's, does. That's, that's terrible, man. Did you, did you ever think about not, not going on and trying to delay it? Yeah, you know, but I just didn't want to. You don't so want to ruin they, that chance, right? If I tell them, like, okay, this is what's wrong with me, 
Th- th- I'm just looking like a liability and like I look like somebody who quit and I'm not a quitter. Right. I right. never give up. I'm not going to tell Survivor. Jeff Probst, like, look, this is something wrong with me. I'm never going to get a chance to play again. If I don't have a, a clear cut answer, I broke my arm. I have, you know, a stomach. I have a, you know, stomach ulcer. I have this. I, I don't know. Whatever. I broke my face. I, my, my toes broke. They've had people that broke their arm or broken their foot that were able to come back in later seasons. But for me to tell them, like, I have these symptoms. I don't know what it is. No doctor can figure it out. They're going to think you just got your body reacted to the pressure. You're not made for this. Yeah. Get the fuck out. But meanwhile, right. I am. I went to Thailand. I've done my Muay Thai. I've played on poker stages. I've never had anything happen to this before. And like, it's playing Survivor on camera. I've been on camera a million times. Playing on Survivor and living on like a tropical paradise is a dream for me. And yet, it all went through the, it all went out the door. And I hope I, I hope I'll be able to play again someday. I really do. So what are the what is it like out there? So do you they put you on an island with nothing? Like it's what do you it's have, what do you it's, it's real, bro. It's real as it looks. It's like a lot of people ask me that question. You get out there, you're two tribes, you you separate. Sometimes a three tribe season. Our side, our season was a two tribe season. You get a bag of rice, but you get no flint, so you have to make fire out of bamboo or like rubbing sticks together. And the first few days you couldn't get any fire, so I all I had to eat were coconuts for three days, and I only lasted three days. So I never was able to get fire because if, once you lose your first immunity challenge, you get flint, and now we can eat rice. So I never ate rice on Survivor. I never you, really sl- slept on Survivor, like I said. Do you get to bring uh, like toiletries at all? Nothing. You take shits in the ocean. They're called aqua dumps. You brush your teeth with wow. sticks, okay? You live in the fucking dirt. You get bit by crabs. You get bit by rats that come by you. There's bugs everywhere. There's fucking birds. You get scabs. It is real as it is. You, there's no oh, there's no like breaks or off camera. Right. You get to eat a granola bar. There's nothing like it is real as it is, and it's great. Now, how it's about awesome. the uh, like the cast and crew? Where where are they? Where where are they? They're they all have- over the place. You don't see them, right? You, there's like it's just an amazing production, but they have like their tents that are there's like there's like imaginary lines where you can't cross. I tell you where that is, but yeah. past them, like throughout the forest, they have like little tents and beds for them to take naps and camera crews like setups where they have and. You know, it, it's it, it. You know, there's booms everywhere in the ocean. When there's conversations going on, like you, you don't see your cameraman in booms, like following us around, and you just gotta ignore the cameras. You never look into the camera, you know. Right. And once in a while, there's been like sites where people look in the camera and are like, "Is this guy serious?" And they like that once in a while, but they might use that. But you not, you don't look in the camera. You just act like you're just you're playing the game, and that's it. Now, do the, what about when they do like the um the confessionals? They they do those on right. They have like a confessional where you get to talk to the camera. Yeah. So the confessionals are called walks. We call them. We're taking a walk. So like, Oh, you're going in your walk and stuff. Right. And, um, they do them in like half an hour, like blocks. So, you know, they'll, they'll take you after an immunity challenge or, you know, uh, right before we, after you lose the immunity challenge and they take you about two or three at a time. They have two, three different stations around the island, like on your area where your camp set up. One would be on the beach. Sometimes you're like in the forest. So they have different shots and stuff. So when you're you're on your walk, and that happens usually every other day or every day or every when they want to talk to you. And do they, they ask you questions, right, and tell you like give you ch- things to talk about? Is yeah, they say what's going on. What do you think about this? So you see, okay. you and Aaron are seeing to be a bit close. What do you think about him? What do you think about this girl Elaine? What do you, well, who do you think you want out tonight? Like, do you think if what happened if you go home tonight? Like, you, and this is actually uh, what do you, what else is on your mind? Just go and speak. Just rant. They want you to. They want the entertainment value. They casted me as a talker. Right. You know, they, what they knew the value that I could bring is I'm a talker that I could literally take, like tell you everything what's going on and the way I speak. And they love that. Like I can tell a story to get on survivor. You have to be able to tell a story. And if you can't, you're, you're not, you haven't, you stand no chance. Well, what I thought was interesting about survivor is that I read, I think I read some behind the scenes about the first season when Richard Hatch won that the producers knew that Richard Hatch was going to win. Like they had each personality that they were, were going to cast. And they could tell based on the, what the personality types were who like the final three would be. Well, they have their winners. They have their pick winners pick. Uh, uh, me, Vince, and Tommy was was Jeff's like win, men to watch. And yep. I forgot who was women was women to watch. But like Matt Van Wagenen thought I would never had no chance. Jeff thought I had no chance. He thought I'd be because uh, I was. Just, he said that I had too much of a, a deadly stare and people would be intimidated by my look. I'm, I have too, my dark features and all this shit. Um, which I, I told him no. And he, it, and the, the fucked up thing about it, he was proven right, but it was because of what happened with me. I, I can, I can guarantee. Yeah. Yeah. Like if I was in perfect health and I went out there, am I first out? No, I'm not. Right. Do I, could I have been first out? Yes. But like, 
there were so many times where like Chelsea on my tribe tried talking to me and I was so fucked up. I didn't even like look at her and I was just like, wasn't taken in well. And I was just out of it. And people thought I was this weirdo. Never have been seen like that in the light, but you know, um, I forgot where I was going with this. So what, happens, so what happens when you get voted off? Where, where do you go? You go to Ponderosa, the place where you, you wait for the, our season didn't have an edge of extinction or redemption Island or an exile, yep. you know, all these places. So, these like twi different twists where you stay in the whole game, you stay the whole time. No, we you get voted out if you're the first six or seven, seven usually in a season, you're called pre-merge. You're not really part of the whole show. You wait for the other pre-merges to get voted off the first seven. And then you wait at this place called Ponder Rosa. When the seventh person gets voted off, they take you on a vacation. They take you away to other Australia, usually Australia, and you just like stay in a hotel there and you steer in a little group. You have chaperones, you have no cell phone, no nothing. You really? can't talk to anybody. Wow. Yep. You're not allowed to talk to anybody. Besides the people in your crew, then we go on like little trips, little day trips, little restaurants. So then, like the then then down to thirteen is the jury, and then then when they get voted, they still they go to Ponderosa. We're gone now, and they they set up, and now they're at Ponderosa, and the jury comes in every time. Like you see them come walk in, part of the jury, and then sit there. That's that's the main goal. You want to at least get on the jury, so you're like a, somebody who's been remembered. And right. my, for me, a first boot is pretty memorable. Like all first yeah. boots, first person knocked out. So it's better than getting voted off third. Or second or fourth, in my mind, chances of ever getting on again. Am I holding on going to play? Do I think I have a great chance of getting on again? No. If they do a first boot season, yes, which a lot of people want to see. Do I think you I do think a whole you, I think you have a good chance to get back to get back on. I think you gotta tell that get that story out there, you know? Yeah, I, I appreciate that, Eddie. And I think if they do a first boot season, I they can't not not cast me. I think they don't do a whole season, I think they do a first boot tribe versus runner-ups something like that yeah so now and also now there's five women and five men right five first boot men and women so are they gonna take me as one of the five guys they choose i would say hopefully yes i know there's like two definitely that are locks one is pat cusack i don't know if you follow survivor but one guy named pat from 37 one kid named darnell from season 31 and i think you know is it, you know i think then they have three more spots and i think because i'm young and because they knew what I was capable of from casting, I think they do cast me, and I hope they do. Now, you did you ever think about going on Big Brother like uh, Vanessa no. Russo did? No, I wanted to play Survivor. I didn't yeah. want to be on reality TV. You know, like, would I be lying if I said I there wasn't a part of me that was like, wow, this could you know get me some more exposure and this could be cool and people would know right. me? Yeah, of course. I'm not going to lie to you, but like, I only wanted to play because I love the game, you know. And the million dollars is great, but. You know, I wanted to play the game of Survivor. I thought it was such a fuck. Like, Jeff Probst is cool and, like, the history of it and all the winners. And, like, I really love it, man. I, lo I love the game. You know, I really do. Do you keep in touch with anyone from the from the cast? Yeah. So? I, I, yeah, my cast, I keep in touch with Missy, uh, Aaron. We're pretty close. Um, the pre-mergers, like, Molly, Chelsea, Jason Linden, we're pretty close. We have our own group chats. I talked to a lot of other people from different seasons. Like, I got really yeah. close to Kellen um, Bechtold from season 36, Dominic Abate, from Ghost Island. They're both from Ghost Island. Uh, you know, a kid like Albert Estrade, who was a really close friend prior. He's season 23, uh, South Pacific, uh, 22. And uh, Coach, who's a pretty big, big, uh, big iconic survivor. I uh, met him in, and Runner Abrino. We've, we're pretty close now. Uh, we talk a lot. You know, like it's a, it, it is a family. And I, I Sandra, yeah. I'm cool with her. You know, I met uh, Adam Klein. We play poker on Saturdays. We have our own Zoom chat. And Adam Klein, me, James Lynn, Dominic Abate, Kellen. There's like 15 of us. This week we're getting Gabby Pescucci. Uh, Fish, Stephen Fishback's been on with us a few times. So like we play every Saturday. It's only survivors, invite only. We just play all the time on Zoom. We play like sit and goes on Poker Size Home Game, $25. And we just yell at each other and talk shit. It's fun. Yeah, I, I would imagine that's uh, a type of fraternity, right? Anyone who can stay on a des deserted island by yourself with nothing. Yeah. That's gotta be tough. That's gotta be tough. I can never do. I could not do that. I couldn't even go camping in my backyard if I. If I <laughs> it's if I tough, wanted. man. It's hard. It's harder than it looks. People want to talk shit from their couch and like, oh, you should have done this. You should have done that. You should. They're eating. They're well fed. They're well rested. Try making decisions like on an empty stomach. Twenty six days in, you lost forty pounds. You feel like not forty. You lost twenty pounds. You feel like dust. You know, people are trying to backstab you left and right. You don't know who to trust. Who you can't. And like, you know, to see a guy like I don't know if you watch Winners at War yet. Uh, no, it's the last no, season. No. Well, this guy who just won, he's just, he's just remarkable. To see these people like play at the, at the level they do after being out there for so many days, it's like my hats off to them. It's it's just a hard game. Yeah. No, good for you. So how did you get on? You just made a tape? 
I was like, yo, I'm gonna. I just made it the one thing I'm gonna do. I'm like, I'm gonna get on Survivor. There's so many people that tried multiple times and never got on. Right. Some people on my season tried like ten times, like eight times, seven times, four. They finally got on. It was a dream, and I tried once and I got on. You know, like, Good for you. like again, I'm like really privileged and like lucky. You know, but I was like, I'm gonna get on the show, and I did it, and it's an accomplishment that I can put up with the rest of my accomplishments. And you know, like I'm still young, and I have so many more things that I want to do with life. And Survivor is just a chapter. But it's like kind of an open chapter, and it's still a wound, you know. Like yeah. I, I still get anxiety, and I still hurt about it. I still scream "fuck" in the shower once in a while because of the time and the next thing I explained to you, and and I, I, it's like a fine line to buy, to walk on, not looking like a crazy person, talking about what happened, and not looking like it was a like an excuse or what have you. And it's not like it's real. It happened, and for the people that know me prior to Survivor, they know it's real. And some people after I can I, I'm very good at knowing how people perceive me in real time, so I can tell by people's vibes like oh yeah heart, or if they don't care or either you know I don't want to be the guy looking for attention when people ask me I tell them, but then through yeah. the conversation you can tell they're like yeah yeah they're like oh it's too bad or they think you're just like you just were weak or you just you know didn't have it or something so happened or what does uh, the rest of 2020 look like for you? <laughs> what it looks like for everyone? <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> I'm playing online, you know I'm playing on. Uh, you know, ACR once in a while. I'm playing, I'm playing on um, WSOP and you know other things that I, we spoke about. And uh, I mean, are I, you I, going back into a casino when they open, or are you like, no, I'm not, I'm I'm not going to be. I, my sister got coronavirus. You know, I don't want to be, uh, you know, spreading fear out through people. But I personally know people who have died. Not people. One person from Brockton, '69, who passed away running a game, which was not cool. You know, and I know people that have gotten sick. My sister, and there's so many like long-term effects they don't even know like you know kids will get this kawasaki thing and older people like uh, like us can get like blood clots and like like it can affect our breathing long term we we don't know what this is doing some people don't even get affected by it i think i might have had it i want to get the antibody test soon but to answer yeah. your question why I be back in casinos playing these 400 games fuck no not right away i got no, a 77 year old dad to take care of like who's yeah. really got pre-existing conditions who's really vulnerable to the situation I saw that they were putting up some type of plexiglass somewhere. Right, not, right, right. Yeah, on the, the blackjack tables, that's their, that's their main priority, right? Their main focus is yeah. getting people back to playing in the pits where they make all their money. Poker's on the poker's on the back burner for the win and the Bellagio and all that. That's where they make, you know, poker players bring a lot of value in like filling the restaurants. They, they make guarantee money off the rake. It, 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 it gives people jobs like poker dealers. I feel bad for the poker dealers and – some people that lost their jobs. Vegas is taking the hardest hit, and it's going to take the hardest hit in the whole country. I got a house out here. I got my life's out here. My dad's out here. And unfortunately, I, you know, after these stimulus checks, and when it gets really, really bad, and who knows? I, I hope not. And knock on wood again. And I hope we can recover sooner than later and they get a vaccine. But I, you're not going to see me in a casino playing anytime soon, even really? if they allow you to. If they allow us to, and I, I don't want to be – like I'll, I'll see what happens. I'll, I'll talk – I know there's kids out there who don't give a fuck. Yeah. Like I know them personally. It's like – Fuck coronavirus. I'll talk to them and see what's going on. I'll text right. them. Hey, you, oh, you play the Bellagio today? Yeah, I played four-handed. Games are good, dude. Like this is, and I'll see what happens. See if we get a spike in results or people start getting sick again. Were you know. shocked? Were you shocked that the World Series of Poker was canceled? No, I was. I was in Asia for two months from January. I left before the coronavirus even happened. Really? Before wow. anybody, dude, I left on a plane to Thailand January 10 of this year. I got to Whoa. I got to this retreat doing meditation and yoga on January 14th, and everybody talked about coronavirus. I stayed there for two months. Was on 16 planes. I went to Cambodia, Indonesia, Philippines, and Thailand again. I went to Thailand twice in that trip. I had to contract the virus. I, I 16 planes, eight cities, two months. I got back, quarantined myself away from my dad. Now then, I got my own apartment. Now I moved in with my boy Donnie and his wife Dana, and yeah, I. I I might. I don't know. I hope I had it. Everybody, obviously, everybody hopes they had it and they beat it and they're fine. You know, but I don't know. Well, uh, somebody don't know. wants me to tell you something, Ronnie. You're a really great talker. Have you entertained doing any poker commentary? You'd be great for any broadcast. Yes, I thank you. Thank you so much, John. Uh, I would love to, the WPT asked me to do some to be the color. They were going to pay me nine hundred dollars or thousand dollars like a day, and I turned them down because it was in the midst of me feeling terrible. And when I felt terrible, I couldn't articulate myself. Like, Eddie, if you asked me to do this, this you know, live feed uh, interview like a year ago, I, was, I would have turned you down because yeah. I literally couldn't think of words like literally and everyone. I had such a brain fog from all the antibiotics and drugs that I was on trying to heal myself. But to, to answer the kid's question, yeah, fuck yeah. If w, I want to get back to doing W, I would love to do the uh, uh, 
to be a color commentator on WPT or WSOP. Yeah, I would love to get out there. I think it, it, it'll be a lot of fun. I could obviously tone down the the profanity when it comes to like a professional setting. I can right. definitely not say the f bomb. I know how to not. You know, I can in a professional setting. I can I can, you know. Let's see. We got Ho- Jose here. It says a uh, great interview at Ronnie's a class act on and off the felt. Oh, it's my boy Jose. Yeah, he he used to play in. Uh, he's a 2040 limit holding player. Limit of the limit guys. He's a legend, uh, Jose. Uh, b- thanks for the shout out, Jose. I love you, buddy. He lives in Seattle now. Great dude. Yeah. I know, I know, I know, Jose. We're in a couple of fantasy football leagues together. Oh, nice. <laughs> it's a sm- small world. Yeah. Uh, all right, man. Hey, so you're not going to go back into the casinos. I don't think I am either. I think I'm going to wait like six months after they open and just see what, you know, see what ends up happening. But I mean, do you think that people are going to be playing 10 handed like a year from now? Or do you think that's over? I don't think it's over. I think once there's a vaccine, like I just hope that this isn't the beginning of like, a whole bunch of pandemics. Like we might get different right. viruses. Like, who knows? Like I, I nobody know. knows what's going to happen. Like, Oh my, this thing's mutating. Are we going to get something else after, after we find the vaccine for this, this is going to be the, the ongoing thing for the rest of our lives. Or, or, or I hope fucking, I pray I'm not a religious man. I'm a Jewish guy. Like I'm a, my mom's slightly religious, but I, I'll, I put prayers in once in a while. I hope that we're all able to like go back to what kind of what it used to be. I think if we find a vaccine, I think if people get it and are able to like get through it, I think if they, they have some kind of medication or, you know, I, I'm, I'm not an expert in this, obviously. I, and I know as much as everybody else does is I just hope that we beat this and we're able to get back to what's, what life kind of used to be. Do I think, do we shake hands like we used to? No. So we're gonna be, are we going to be taking care of ourselves a bit more? I think the silver lining here is that we're going to be taking more vitamins, taking better care of ourselves. Like wipe, like I think people are gonna start like you know how many times you go to the Rio, people after taking a piss in a tournament, people don't wash their fucking hands. Oh uh, yeah, like wash your hands, yeah. dude. Wash your right. hands. I think everybody's right. gonna be washing their hands. I think they're gonna be paying sanitizer, wearing like you know. I used to like look at Asian kids. I'm like, why are these Chinese kids wearing masks? Like, like, like I guess they don't like they just maybe they they're like they're sick. They don't want to get people to jump. That's really thoughtful. But now I think that might be a new norm. I don't like the I like the phrase new normal. It kind of drives me crazy. But it might be a new norm, and people like. Might wear I might wear a mask to play poker once in a while so I won't get sick. But I want to like, show my pretty face, so I might not. You know, I see people, people <laughs> right. see. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Ryan. Well, listen, I'm gonna let you get out of here, man. But hey, I really appreciate your time tonight. Really appreciate you coming on. Eddie, it was a pleasure, bro. I really had a great time uh sharing all those uh the, the baseball card talk. I yeah. added you on Facebook. I mean, oh, I had you on Facebook, but I uh, started following you on Twitter. Let's talk more baseball cards. Yeah, ab- said, absolutely, man. I'll I'll get your number when we get off this and uh we'll talk more. All right, buddy. Hey. Take care, man. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, man. Take care. All right. Take care.